Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Scharf, co-founder and co-host of Austin Next Live. And this is Austin Next, the video podcast. We are doing our second <coughs> experiment in, uh, in doing this online. We are on today on uh, LinkedIn. And welcome to all of those that are watching. Um, we've got some good stuff to talk about uh, this, this afternoon. But first, I kind of wanted to go through some numbers and give everybody a feeling for what we're looking at when we talk about where's the next terawatt coming from in Texas. So, um, no, oh. All right. When we're talking about power, there's really four pieces to this puzzle. Obviously, the first is generation. We talk about that a lot when we talk about fossil fuels nuclear, solar, wind, hydro, and uh, to some extent now geothermal and even hydrogen. We talk about transmission, getting it from the source to the distribution points, the local points. And one of the more interesting things is, is that over long distances, we can lose up to 60% of our generated power. Uh, it goes off in heat in those lines that you see crossing uh, the, the plains and the prairie. Then we get to distribution. Uh, of course, that's where our local power companies like Austin Electric come in. Their responsibility is to build and maintain that distribution system as well as get the power to our homes. And then finally, usage. We've got commercial versus residential, time of day. You know, it's known in the industry still as the duck curve. We could talk about that later. And the actual use. Uh, whether it's heating, lighting, our electric vehicles, and everything else that we do uh, with that power. Now, we're going to start with a focus on, on generation. Nationally, we do about 60-40 fossil fuels and non-fossil fuel energy generation. And that comes from nuclear, it comes from wind and hydro, and of course solar. In Texas, we still have that 60-40 split, give or take, but our mix is much different. Uh, about 10% of our power comes from nuclear, but 25% comes from wind power. And that makes Texas very uh, uh, unique in that aspect of it. Now, I don't think any other state comes close to generating 25% of its power from wind. Solar, 6%, and then fossil fuels, 59%. However, Everybody talks about the uh, 2021 Superstorm Uri and how everything went black for a few days. We came close not too long ago. The Christmas Eve 2022 freeze, um, we were actually bailed out by fossil fuels, especially natural gas. Our nuclear, 80% of their capability, but the wind power dropped from 25% on average to only 5%. And solar, zero. But as I said, nat gas, 87% of our power, 87% of our power for those couple of days were generated by fossil fuels. And it was um, almost all of that from nat gas, 73%. So of course I lost my next slide, but that's okay. Um, you know, when we talk about new generation, uh, ERCOT is talking about doing, um, really hitting a milestone this year. And we're talking about, let me see if I got these here. We're going to increase our wind power and increase our solar power so that our, our uh, intermittent power sources will go from about 30% to 37%. At the same time, nat gas drops from 40 some odd percent down to 36%. So for the first time, we are here with a situation where um, more power will be generated from solar and wind than from that gas. And that's a big change for us. So I'm going to welcome Bill McCamley from Transit Forward uh, to the podcast. Appreciate you showing up. Appreciate you being here. Uh, everybody that knows about Transit Forward understands that you guys are focused on Project Connect and enabling us to get around Austin uh, a little easier with a little less traffic and a little more bus, rail, and everything else in between. So there we go. And also joining us is Christy Cardenas. Christy is the Managing Director of Grit Ventures. Welcome, Christy. Thank you, Michael. Hi, Bill. So, Hi, Christy. 
I'm going to have you guys each introduce yourselves a little bit, give me some of your background, and then we're going to talk about generation and talk about where we go from here. Christy, why don't you start? Sure. Um, so I, as Michael mentioned, I'm a managing partner at Grit Ventures. We focus on deep technologies at the earliest stages, and I'm heavily focused on energy. My uh, background is also in energy. I started in investment banking right around the last credit crisis at the advent of the shale revolution. So I do have conventional energy experience, uh, after which I moved into large scale energy infrastructure, private equity for a fund that's now at BlackRock, um, doing large scale power generation projects, transmission, distribution, um, securitizations, and also looking at new technologies because at the time venture capital really wasn't paying attention to energy infrastructure. Um, that hole in technology development is really what led me to get into venture and here I am. Bill? Yeah, first of all, Michael, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to y'all and all of your listeners and watchers today. Uh, my name is Bill McCanley. I'm the executive director of Transit Forward, which is an awesome base 501c3 with a real mission to both educate and engage our friends and neighbors, as you said, uh, about Project Connect specifically, but also as the transit situation as a whole evolves here in Austin. You know, we truly believe that a world-class city like Austin deserves and needs a world-class transit system to take ourselves to the next level. And having these kind of discussions is really kind of in our breadbasket. So appreciate you having me on. I will also say um, one of my previous roles was as a state representative in New Mexico, where I sat on the energy committee and really kind of got a little bit into the weeds with energy transmission, since that's such a big deal when we talk about wind and solar. Christy can talk about that very much as well and know all about the duck curve and all about storage and that sort of thing. So I'd be happy to contribute in any kind of way if you want me to put on that other hat, which I need because I don't have y'all's natural covering anyway. <laughs> I expect we will over the course of the hour. So when we talk about generation, the goal, especially with uh, with climate change and where we are there is to eventually decarbonize. And for me, the word is eventually. I really have a problem when people start talking about, oh yeah, within four years, we're gonna do this, or six years, we're gonna do that. It's taken us well over hundred years to get this energy infrastructure to where we are. And I don't think it's gonna take just five years for us to move away from it. So when we talk about generation, what are the sources of generation that we can expect to see um, move forward, especially here in Texas. Christy, you've got some investments there. Why don't we talk about some of those? Sure. Um, so good question. Um, and I agree with your point, just that it will, well, I, I think there's maybe two points. One, we have to save the world, you know, the world, the earth be humans, the earth wins. But, um, second of all, it will take time. These are hard assets. There are pipes and, you know, trillions of dollars has gone into developing these infrastructures. Um, I want to say the last statistic that I saw, the EIA projected um, about 40 percent of our electricity generation would still be from natural gas and coal in like 2050. You know, so it takes time. Um, that said, renewables are going to be an increasingly um, relevant part of the discussion and the way that happens is energy storage so i think that's a massive piece of it and then there are new technologies coming on and you know that's will take time um but nuclear is a big piece of that improved renewables improved energy storage um and then you know new new stuff like geothermal and other forms of generation it's Christy, it's, it's interesting you mentioned geothermal. Um, when I started my investment banking firm back after the last credit crisis, um, our first client was actually an African nation who was looking at geothermal and they'd asked us to get a few folks involved because I'd worked with the with NREL before. And they asked us to get, us, to get involved in doing some um, capacity and some feasibility surveys. Kind of weird for an investment banker, but okay, that's us. <laughs> um, and you know, the other one that we keep hearing about quite often is hydrogen. And here's something I had no idea. A third of the world's hydrogen pipelines 
are in Texas. I had no clue that we had that kind of hydrogen infrastructure here. And um, it means that potentially Texas has got those two sources to draw upon. Plus the fact, as you mentioned, uh, the ability to, if we catch up with the rest of the US, uh, that would be doubling our uh, energy from nuclear. Unfortunately, um, it's one of those things where these things take time and um, none of this stuff is being built right now. So it's going to be a while before we can bring that stuff on board. Bill, you've got experience from a legislative point of view, and, and we were talking before the show about the three grids in the United States, the East, the West, and Texas, um, and how they don't really connect. And that sometimes is a problem for us. And sometimes, to be honest, is probably a good thing for us, because when I used to live in that other state along the West Coast, they did very, very little generation within the state, and they were almost entirely dependent upon buying uh, power from other states. And I'm happy to see that we weren't in that marketplace um, competing with our own state to, to power you know, other states. Um, what was your experience in terms of developing a, a, a position uh, for power and for trans, tra transportation, transmission of the power? Yeah, so it, it was a really fascinating topic to get involved with. Um, you know, New Mexico, where I was from, has 2 million people all in. So basically imagine a population the size of the greater Austin metro area in a state probably, you know, a quarter to half the size of Texas. So very, very spread out, not a lot of folks. What New Mexico does have, though, kind of like what Texas has, is frankly a lot of area for solar collection and a lot of really good areas to collect wind. In fact, Texas has been, frankly, a leader. And it's, it's interesting because a lot of folks on kind of the left side of the, of the political spectrum uh, have some scheidenfruit about Texas because it's like, oh, all this stuff we don't like. And then Texas basically leads the nation because of all the wind in the west part of the state on renewable energy. The, the question you've got to ask yourself when you're talking about renewable energy is many times the places in the United States where that kind of energy is best produced is not really near the urban areas where most of the power is being consumed, right? So in rocket science, you got to figure out a way, how are we going to get the lines built to get from the places where there are a lot, there's a lot of sun and you don't have a lot of issues putting, you know, acres and acres of solar panels up or windmills and getting that to those really, really important places. So what I found fascinating was the, conflict that is generated about the transmission lines itself everybody wanted the renewable energy everybody wanted these resources it's, it's great for the earth it's great for the economy in a lot of ways shapes and forms um tax revenue is an interesting one which we can talk about in a little bit as those things need to shift but from a transmission perspective which you really gotta have for this to work Nobody wanted. We, we talk about here in Austin, the acronym NIMBY for housing development, not in my backyard. I want the stuff just not near me. Well, you had that exact same type of mindset when it came to transmission. I mean, the military bases didn't want it. The Native American folks didn't want it. A, a rancher after a bill I introduced on transmission that actually had the possibility of eminent domain at, and they're threatened to shoot me in a roundabout way if that stuff went in on his stuff. Um, and it's funny because a lot of the environmentalists who you would think would be real proponents of this from a climate change perspective, they worry about critical habitats and lines going through there, right? So that's, Christy hit the nail on the head that storage is gonna be an absolute must because that's what happens. And you talked about that on Christmas Eve when the sun goes down and there ain't a lot of wind, what do these energy, production companies do. They crank up basically jet engines with natural gas to produce the energy that is needed. And that's what we found here in Texas. But it happens all across the country. Yeah. The question is going to be moving forward. Can you get that transmission set up? Can you get enough really groundbreaking storage capabilities so that when you hit those dips, right, um, that can be good for the grid? And just one last thing, you talked about that duck curve, and I'm sure you can talk about that more a little bit, but it's interesting because as you look across timelines in the country, when the sun is going down, right, in, in California, you've got, it's already down in other places. So you, 
technically could produce more power in California and help fund energy going east and the other way around when the sun is really up and, and producing in places like you know uh, Colorado or New Mexico you can go out to, Col it, to to California Texas does not have that capability because most of Texas with the exception of El Paso in the west and a, a few counties on the east are actually not on those grids but that that's another interesting kind of national conversation to have yeah well let, let's talk about the Doug curve real quick just so folks understand it when everybody thinks about power usage the normal way or the way I used to think was that you get up and with the beginning of the day, up goes the power usage as everybody goes to work and factories and offices start cranking out all their ideas and all their products. And then as people go home, the curve you know, declines and usage goes down because people are home and they're just watching TV and cooking. No, actually it's not. We have a little bit of that rise as factories and offices start up, but then it declines until people get home and turn on their air conditioners and turn on their heat pumps and turn on their pools and turn on their their cooking apparatus whether it's electric or gas doesn't matter um and all of a sudden you see this great big spike in energy usage so that's kind of looks like the back of a duck uh hence the name um it, it's interesting when we talk about storage because when i was working with early stage companies back around the dot-com boom and you're showing, seeing how old i am um we used to work a lot with the federal government on what are called SBIR, Small Business Innovation Grant Work. And the process called for every federal agency that had an R&D budget had to set aside a couple percentage points for small businesses. And their normal annual process would go something like this. They would issue a shopping list for the kinds of things that they wanted small businesses to focus on. Now I have to tell you, every year that I was involved in this, whether it was any department within the Department of Defense or NASA, the number one, sometimes the number two and the number three item on that shopping list was batteries. Mm -hmm. Big ones for energy storage, little ones for our war fighters who more and more are carrying electronic gear. Now, I left that wor world in eh, 2004, 2005, um, got back into it a little bit in the late 20 teens and lo and behold, that shopping list contained the same things. So Christy, what's new in battery storage and what can we expect? Cause I'm hoping it's going to be wonderful stuff. Yeah. I, and to your point, Michael, the SBI our program is a big part of it. And basically what's happened is, you know, there's a specific percentage for each agency to dedicate to small businesses and that not only have R&D budgets increased, but that percentage has increased. So there's more and more attention there. Um, and the other piece of it is that the batteries we have aren't good enough yet. You know, there are um, considerations in terms of resource requirements and in, in terms of safety. And many of them are flammable. There are a lot of different pieces that are just not quite perfect about lithium ion batteries. And so um, we're seeing a lot of activity in the space at the earliest stages at, you know, really funded by the government. Um, you know, there are some interesting solutions out there that are still in that government funding phase. Um, there's a, a flow battery that uses a nanofuel that you can recharge and it can be let, pumped in legacy pipes. There are um, all sorts of different battery chemistries that are being used, solid state batteries. I mean, at this point, I think the challenge is that no clear winner has emerged. You know, people are, there's, we've neglected the space in some depth for the last couple of decades from a private capital markets perspective in that we, we now have a lot of government activity, a lot of, federal incentives and a lot of reason to pay attention to it here, but it's all kind of these baby technologies that we haven't quite figured out. Um, and the other piece that I will say is I'm also seeing um, some interesting new business models associated with mature battery technologies. So Jupiter Power is a company here in Austin. They do grid 
scale energy storage just with conventional, you know, lithium ion batteries. And they basically have a merchant battery model that um, that allows for them to correct for this variability and constraints in transmission and solve some of the renewable time of day issues that you're mentioning with the duck curve. Um, and they're encountering major success. They they just sold to BlackRock, I believe. So well, people are you know, working on We want them to be it. successful. We need them to be. There was a yeah. an EV battery company, I want to say about eight or nine years ago, that had a very different model for batteries because obviously all the issues we brought up with battery chemistry and the charging issues that we haven't talked about, their model was to get the manufacturers to make uh, batteries, use their existing battery packs, but make them easily interchangeable. And uh, they, swapping. in essence, I'm sorry? Is it like battery swapping? Exactly. And they had some machinery where you wouldn't have to charge your batteries. You could drive over, um, you know, like a, an oil change place and your batteries got swapped and 10 minutes later you were gone with a fresh battery. Um, as EVs grow in their popularity, whether it's on the West Coast or in Texas, where we're seeing more and more EVs being purchased and used on Austin roadways every day, um, there's gotta be some kind of different business model or some kind of different um, mode for handling all those batteries throughout their life cycle. So if some entrepreneur has a great idea I think I know a VC that might be interested. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's true. They and I actually have been digging into just these different approaches, which solve you know. So one of the constraints, to your point, um, is there's a lack of standardization in batteries. You know, whereas oil is oil is oil, and you can pump it in pipes, and whether it comes from Exxon or Chevron, it all looks the same. Uh, you don't have that situation with batteries. And so people are trying to figure it out. And that's been one of the big challenges with the battery swap guys is, you know, how do you deal with that lack of standardization and you know, create a business model that makes sense, you know, exactly. and people, are, people are doing all sorts of stuff there. There are some um, new solar cars out there where they utilize solar gas or excuse me, solar glass and, the, that will supplement the vehicle's power drive and try to alleviate some of the constraints on the battery. Um, and then the, there's the charging infrastructure, which is another, you know. Well, that gets back to the transmission and distribution. I mean, um, it's going to be very interesting. There's about 115,000 gas stations in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to have many, many more charging points because it's so much obviously less expensive to put a, a EV charger in your home than it is to build your own little gas station. You know, <laughs> try to get that permitted in an Austin neighborhood. Oh yeah, I wanna put a 10,000 gallon gas tank underneath my house. I don't think that's gonna work. Um, how do we handle from a distribution point of view this massive change in what we're gonna see? Yeah, well, we haven't cracked the code yet. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the, I, yes, I have it, more questions than answers. That's for sure. Yeah. The, and I think the biggest issue is that you're dealing with infrastructure and we haven't really figured out who's going to be the, the guys to build it out. You know, I mean, right now there's kind of a, a fragmented universe of players that are um, trying to solve this equation, one of which is, um, you know, the charge points of the world, these right. startups right. and uh, companies that are in the process of growing up that are trying to build out the networks themselves and working with municipalities and other entities. Then there are the oil and gas guys who are already, you know, already have some infrastructure in energy distribution. Um, you've got the autos who mm -hmm. wouldn't, you know, aren't a conventional solution. What, what happened with energy was the guys producing the energy, the oil and gas, then coordinated the distribution. And now we have a situation where the autos, who are really more the end consumer that needs to be enabled by this infrastructure, are then getting into the energy infrastructure EV charging game. And so, you know, Tesla is one example of that. Mercedes, 
actually just announced that they are building out their own electric vehicle charging infrastructure that I understand will serve not only Mercedes vehicles, but they're basically getting into the energy infrastructure game. Um, and then hopefully the utility. Those, uh, hopefully those will be able to charge not only Mercedes, but Teslas and GMs and everything else. First time I went to a car show that was featuring electric cars, I sat down with the local utility who was there and said, okay, how many different versions of the plugs are there? And this is about <laughs> yeah. 10 years ago. I think there were six, you know, and one was an ISO version and everything else was custom. So it's one of those things. So Bill, I got a question. My three-year-old grandson thinks I have a magic wand in my drawer. And if I took that magic wand out and waved it and said, okay, we have enough power. Yep. We have it distributed. When we make decisions to do things in terms of usage, mm -hmm. how much can we really impact the amount of power that is needed for a city the size of Austin? Yeah, and you're getting to the other end of the equation in terms of the power situation here, which we've been talking about the funnel in. Right. Right. Because we need the funnel out. And there are some really interesting things that can be done on the efficiency side to allow folks the ability to use less power, therefore decreasing demand and making things a little easier. I also want to say one thing just to level set here. It's fascinating that we talk about kind of fossil fuels and solar and wind and all that fossil fuels let, let's all be very honest with what we're talking about fossil fuel is solar power those plants from you know hundreds of thousands millions of years ago that we are mining out of the earth they took the sun in right and they used that to create themselves and then they got buried the the pressure that was put on them by the earth to turn them into this this uh, either coal or oil or gas or whatever, it's just an extremely efficient way of taking solar energy and using it for what we need. So it's just, it's an interesting thing that I don't think a lot of people kind of put two and two together, but we should really understand that, that, that the energy storage and the transmission, the reason that we use oil and gas is because it is one of the most efficient ways from a storage and transmission aspects that we have to get energy to where it's got to go. So using these other things is just that. So I'm sorry, Michael, you said you yeah. No, 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 you're absolutely right. In, in essence, fossil fuels are the only renewable resource in terms of energy. It just takes a million and a half years. Yeah, right. So and it's also terrible for the environment right now. We're having all sorts of negative externalities there. But there you go. The, the, the question you asked is really interesting. So I know I don't have the exact numbers on this, but I know that there's a lot of um, difference that can be made, for instance, with insulation. There's a lot of housing and buildings out there that if they were insulated with modern materials, you can actually really reduce the need for power when you need a lot of heat or when you need a lot of cooling in the summertime that um, is something we can really do. And then you talk about the transportation argument. And that's really why I think you brought me on here. And I did do some research on this. So let me just start with some numbers. Uh, first off, from a climate change perspective, 28% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the United States are actually from transportation, 28%. So over a quarter are from transportation me measures. And one of the biggest um, parts of that is single use automobiles. Now, let me also say a typical trip on public transportation. So if you use a bus or a train or whatever, emits 55% fewer greenhouse gas emissions than, than driving or ride sharing alone. So just from a greenhouse gas emission standpoint, using mass transit, you know, when we get this world-class transit system for our world-class city, will really help and move the needle specifically on the climate change uh, situation that we all know about here, especially since we had record-setting heat last summer. From a specific energy efficiency standpoint, let me just talk about this. The main characteristics of en affecting energy consumption in the transportation game are rolling resistance. So what kind of resistance does my wheel have rolling along the surface? Drive efficiency. So how efficiency is the energy that I'm using and pushing the vehicle I have going forward? Drag coefficient, which is how much wind is getting in my way, right? As I, as I push through the air. And frontal area and weight. So the rolling resistance of a hard, almost inflexible train or tram wheel. So we're talking about a basically a metal wheel on a metal track, uh, on a similarly inflexible track has a coefficient of rolling resistance at approximately 0 
10 times lower than a bus tire and as much as 20 times lower than a correctly inflated car tire on asphalt, right? So when you talk about trains from a rolling resistance perspective, it is the most efficient way that we know of to kind of roll forward right now until we get some kind of, you know, air vehicle or something like that. that uh, Magnetic gravitation is wonderful. Yeah, well, we don't have that yet. So trains yeah. basically from that perspective are the best way of doing that in terms of that rolling resistance. Uh, drive efficiency and weight, frontal weight, also favor electric trains and buses. For trains, once they're running, once you get them going, energy consumption per person is a fraction of the other types of transports. They consume 0.047 kilowatts per kilometer per passenger. Electric buses are at uh, point, excuse me, 0.047. Electric buses are at 0.033 kilowatts per kilometer because um, it takes a little less for them to get going. And cars, electric cars, consume 0.088 kilowatts per kilometer. So electric trains and electric buses, by the way, which Cat Metro is really moving towards for all these new systems, are, are much more efficient and a better way of transportation moving forward in terms of energy usage. So as we build out our infrastructure, which Christy pointed out, these are all infrastructure discussions and these are hard, right? They take a while and you got to yep. move them over time through phases. But as we become better at that here in Austin, you're going to see power consumption from a transportation perspective uh, be a lot less because it's more efficient moving forward. So here's, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's an infrastructure issue. It's also related to a housing issue. We've seen, especially with the pandemic, yep. it's just been amazing to watch what, how people have adapted to this pandemic. I was talking with a builder the other day, and what does he say? What does Gen Z want in their homes? Two offices. That's what they're looking for in their homes, whether it's in Georgetown, or you know, just north of, of UT, they're all talking about the same things. One can be more served with rail and one can't. Um, so we've got a big, a lot of changes that are gonna have to happen if we're gonna start using you know, fixed mass transit, especially fixed mass transit. Um, but you know, there's some other interesting things that people are talking about now. You mentioned the tires and rolling resistance. I was at a presentation by Michelin one of the largest tire companies in the world. And all of a sudden, they're great tires that I use and get 40, 45,000 miles on a set of tires. Put them on an EV, eh, 20,000. Because of the weight? Because of the weight. You've got parking companies, both here in the United States and in Britain, that are seriously concerned about the, the weight of the cars on their existing parking structures mm -hmm. and whether or not if we get to 30, 40, 50% or more EVs, if they can handle those in parking structures. So we've, we've got a huge set of, of secondary effects that I don't think everybody's talking about yet in this push to go electric or obviously one of the answers is mass transit if we can do it. Um, you know, and, and considering that you know, there is no mass transit out here where I live. I don't think there's a single bus that I've ever seen on Bee Caves Road at all. Um, so one of these days, guys, we got to do that. But um, let's kind of close this up. I mean, we've talked about a bunch of the issues. We've, we've serviced them. That's great. I think everybody who listens to this has a little better idea of what's going on. But as we look forward, you know, what's next, Austin? What's next for power? Bill, what are the two or three things that you expect to see next in the next four or five years that will impact both the generation, the distribution, and the usage of power here? Well, I think going into something that you actually just pointed out two or three points ago is, is really something I'd like to go back to, which is the housing component to all of this. There is a jargony term called ETOD, Equitable Transit Oriented Development. And what that means is, to put it in very simple layman's terms, how do we build more density around transit corridors? It's funny because you know my job has basically, when I came in here, I thought I was gonna be really engaging and educating about the bus and the train lines very specifically. I have done more conversations in the last two or three months regarding housing and the, the systematic component that that will bring into the transit system than actually talking about transit itself. And it's actually interesting 
because the Austin Transit Partnership, which is the entity that is going to the federal government to be asking for match funding to build these new commuter lines for light rail, they've been very open and honest that the federal government is going to want to know what's being done on a zone level and other ordinances to allow for more people to live near transit corridors because the, the whole concept isn't rocket science, right? If I can move closer to a rail line or a bus line and use that as a either primary or frankly, my only means of transportation, I can give up a car, right? And I can live in a more dense unit that is going to be from a you know residence by residence comparison, much more energy efficient that way. So I honestly believe that one of the single most critical impacts that can be made over the next four or five years from an energy efficiency standpoint, and I'll trust Christy to talk more about the production aspect, but from a use perspective is, can we get the bus and train lines into place to where they're more universal so people feel comfortable using them as their means of transportation? And number two, can we change our housing ordinances um, to allow for more multi-use development within walking or biking distance of a rail line or train lines where I can use that. that. You see that happening in other kind of Western cities. With, with uh, mass transit, it's funny. Most of the mass transit examples that you think of are in fairly older cities, New York, DC, San Francisco, a lot of cases, Chicago, where the development of the city happened before the advent of the automobile. What you're now That's seeing right. though in kind of newerly expanding cities, so Denver, Salt Lake City, Seattle, is they are moving in this direction where like, hey, look, we're, we're a little bit behind here. We wanna build these trains and bus systems, but we've gotta have the zoning ordinances that will allow for more density and more height uh, around these stations. And one of the biggest issues regarding that here in Austin is what we call compatibility. So Austin has a zoning strategy, what they call quote unquote compatibility, where if I'm gonna build new housing, it's gotta be somewhat compatible with the surrounding areas. And what that means in real life is that you can only build so many stories of apartment complexes, for instance, around uh, a transit station. There was a small change that was made in the last um, city council, which we're really happy with. It's moving in the right direction, but we have one of the most restrictive pieces of compatibility ordinance in the, in the state and reducing things like that and doing more things with terms of more vertical mixed use, possibly less parking. Those sorts of things are going to be really critical moving forward to allow for more people to live near transit and then get to those things that you're talking about very specifically, which is allowing me to give up my car, which is frankly more affordable, but also better for power consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. Chrissy, what's next for power and what's next for Austin? Well, I will just one comment, Bill, keep up the good work. I think it's just absolute insanity, this Texas culture of neglecting mass transit. It's nuts. And I just, Austin has such a potential to be a poster child. We haven't paved the countryside with highways in the same way that Houston and Dallas have. And to me, it's an absolute no brainer. So, you know, you have my support. Thank you. <laughs> Incidentally. Um, and then to your question, Michael, um, Good question. I don't know. I don't know the specifics, but um, what I do know is that there is so much money and so much brain power chasing these solutions. Whether it's fusion, nuclear fusion, you know, better forms of generation, better forms of storage, that we, as a state with a huge component of our economy tied to oil and gas, best get in front of it and be a part of that energy revolution. And so I, my hope is that we put the full force of Texas behind the future while respecting our past. And that's my, you know, my wish for the future. There you go. Bill, Christy, thank you so very much. I appreciate that. Everybody else appreciate you being part of the conversation. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but we will probably take those up at another time. This is a topic that is near and dear, I think, to everybody when they write their checks every month for their power bill, as well as every time they get involved in a uh, ever increasing amount of automobile congestion here in Austin, Texas. <laughs> so, um, you know, stay safe, don't do anything stupid in your cars. And we will see you all soon. 
Thanks again, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Guys, thank you so much. I appreciate it.